everyone. Um, we are going to add another level of protection uh, against the COVID-19 virus, and that is actually through rapid testing. We've taken possession of a large quantity of the Abbott the rapid antigen test. So just like previous videos, I'm gonna walk through some of the logistics of how we're gonna deploy this and use this. And then Dr. Jarvis is gonna come back and talk about some of the science of this uh, particular test. So first, we'll do some routine testing. We are gonna test all asymptomatic employees um, on the first day of your work week. So that is either Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. We'd like for you to do that right at shift change. And when you perform the test, it'll either give you a negative or a positive. If it's negative, you just continue working. If it is positive, then we want you to isolate and then we'll schedule a confirmatory PCR test. If the PCR test is positive, you'll continue to isolate. If it's negative, you'll return to work as long as you're asymptomatic. Dr. Jarvis will cover some of the science on the reason behind that. Let's talk about post-exposure. So we have the just, we're just gonna surveil everybody and do surveillance testing, that's once a week. Then we'll have post-exposure testing. The post-exposure goes into two different routes, vaccinated versus unvaccinated employee. So for vaccinated employees, a vaccinated employee is considered someone who has received both doses of the vaccine and you are two weeks past that. Once then, you're considered vaccinated. Now, how are we gonna know that? A little side note, you're gonna get a survey here in the next week or so asking your name, which vaccine you received, which for most of us, or most of you will be the Moderna vaccine, and what days did you receive the vaccine? I need that back so that we can make this determination. So please make sure you fill out that survey. So what will occur is if you have an exposure and you are considered vaccinated, you will continue to work no matter what phase we are in, phase zero, one, or two. What we will do is we will have you perform one of the rapid antigen tests every day whenever you start your shift. Not every day, not your days off, but the day that you come on shift, we will have you perform the rapid antigen test and then report that. If it's negative, you continue to work. If it's positive, we'll schedule a confirmatory PCR. If that's positive, you isolate. If that's negative, you can return as long as you are asymptomatic. That's for vaccinated folks on a post exposure. For unvaccinated personnel, then we will follow basically the same, or we will follow the same thing in phase zero and phase one staffing. There will be a change in phase two staffing. In phase two staffing, if you're unvaccinated, we will have you perform the rapid antigen test every day when you come on shift for seven days past your exposure. If it remains negative, we move on down the road as long as you're asymptomatic. If it's positive, guess what? We do a confirmatory PCR and go from there then. If you have a household contact, let's say you're a vaccinated employee and you have a household contact who is positive, we'll follow the same process. You'll still come to work. We'll do the rapid antigen test for the next 17 days because we have to go 10 days from when that person is positive and then seven days for you. So that's 17 days. You'll perform the rapid antigen test for 17 days then. If you're unvaccinated, and you have a household contact that is positive, we'll follow the same processes that we do now. It's either phase zero or phase one, and then we'll follow, that, uh, we'll follow the testing process or the regime that we have set out for that. So there's vaccinated and unvaccinated, and it depends on what we do then. What about employees that have had the active disease within the past 90 days? Well, the CDC currently recommends if you've had COVID and you've recovered, from the day that you develop symptoms or tested positive, 90 days forward, if you have an exposure to COVID, there's no need to quarantine or test you and we'll follow the CDC recommendations. If you're past those 90 days and have not been vaccinated, we'll treat you just like an unvaccinated employee. And if you have been vaccinated, then you'll be treated like a vaccinated employee. Again, that's the CDC's recommendations. Those are always subject to change. And if they do change their recommendations, we'll change to adapt to that. Let's talk about what if you're on duty and you become symptomatic. If you're on duty and develop symptoms, you can go ahead and perform one of these tests while you're on duty. Okay. If you're negative, we're still gonna send you home. If you're positive, we consider that a positive. Most likely, either way, we're gonna get a confirmatory PCR test because you are symptomatic and showing symptoms and we wanna make sure that we confirm that with a PCR test. What if you become symptomatic while you're off duty? Do not come to the station to take one of these tests. We will schedule a PCR test just like we currently do and then go from there on that. 
So let's talk about the testing process, what we are asking you to do and what I will do every Monday also. Each station will receive a box. Let's go over the contents of this box. But I'll tell you, you're gonna get one of these boxes at the station and when the contents run low, when the number of tests get low, just order another box. So let's go over the contents of the box. Inside of each one of these boxes comes a little procedure card. You're gonna to wanna to hold on to this because it tells you exactly how to perform the test. It also shows you what positive, negatives, and invalid tests look like. So make sure that you hold on to this. It comes with a little fact sheet for healthcare providers. That's just part of a test. They have to provide this. It comes with a little information card if you want to read all this very small print. Even with my glasses on, I still can't read that. And it also comes with 40 patient fact sheets because there's 40 tests in each one of these. Now, when a box is delivered to you, there's only going to be 38 tests in here, and I'll talk about why. When we receive a box in, it has 40 tests. You can see all of the little tests individually packaged. It comes with a reagent. This box has one bottle of reagent for all of these tests. It is very important that you maintain this and don't lose this, because if you lose this, the box of tests are no good. So make sure that you keep an eye on that and find, remember where it is. It comes with 40 nasal swabs. And we'll talk about those here in just a second. You have to use the nasal swabs that are included in this kit. You can't use any other nasal swab. You have to use these. The kit also comes with a control. So part of what we will do before we deploy the box out is we'll run a positive control and a negative control. So that's the reason that you will only have 38 tests because we will test, we will use two of the tests that are inside of the box. One on the positive control, one on the negative control. I'm not going to walk through how to do the, the controls because we'll do that before we even deploy them out. A couple of key things. One is reporting. When you do this test, we have to report every test, positive or negative or even inconclusive, that is done. So we are going, you're going to have a form, an online form that you'll fill out that will ask a series of demographic questions and different things, and then also about the test and the results of that. You must fill out that form every time you do the do the test. The form takes about two minutes to fill out. Obviously, if the test comes back positive, you need to make sure that you notify the commander immediately, and then we'll start the, the process that goes along with that. So let's actually walk through a test, and you're going to see me give myself a test here. One of the questions that the form is going to ask is for the lot number. That is not the lot number for the box. That is the lot number for the test, and you can find that right here. It says lot, and then it has a series of numbers followed by a letter. That's the number that you want to put in. The kit comes like this. When you open it, you'll pull out the test. This is what the test looks like. A okay. couple of key things. One, you want to make sure that this blue line is present. That is the control for all of these tests. If this blue line is not present, do not use this test. Discard it and go to the next one, but do not use this test if that blue line is not present. You will also see the blue line on the inside. So you need to see the blue line on the outside and the inside. Okay. Important, put your name on the test because if you have a couple of these laying around, you don't want to get them confused. So just write your name on the test here. For this, what you're going to do is open it up, pull it out of the package. I suggest kind of bend it back because that helps it keep flat. It's a lateral flow test, so it must remain flat whenever the test is going. If you have the test bent or you're carrying it around, then the flow does not occur correctly. So make sure that you keep the test flat whenever you're performing it. A okay. couple of different things here. So I've got the blue line. You'll see one well right here, the top well, and then the bottom well. When we talk about putting the reagent, six drops of the reagent into the top well, we're talking about this top hole right here. When we talk about putting the Q-tip or the uh, nasal swab into it, we're talking about this bottom one. Okay, and it walks you through. So the first thing you're going to do, open it, kind of bend it back a little bit. You're going to put six drops of the reagent, exactly six drops, into this. When you put the six drops in, you don't want to do it like this. You want to hold it above it about a half an inch and drop six drops in there. From the time that you put the six drops in until the nasal swab goes in there, you have three minutes to do that. So there's plenty of time to put the drops in here, 
do the swab and then put it inside of here. Once you put the, the swab in there, you'll spin it three times to the right. And then you'll peel this off, close it up, and you wait 15 minutes. You have to wait 15 minutes to read the results. If this line right here, the control line, turns pink, and the sample line, there's nothing there, that's a negative. If the control line turns pink and the sample line turns pink, that's a positive. If this control line does not change colors and it stays blue, that's an invalid test and you'll have to redo it. So we're actually gonna walk through a test. I'm gonna test myself here. Um, so we're gonna walk through that. Okay, so I have the test open. I'm gonna take the lid off of the reagent and put in six drops. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, I have three minutes now to put the swab in there. Utilizing the swab that is provided, little tip here, do about five huffs into your mask, not blowing your nose, but kind of holding here. And the reason you're doing that is to build up a little bit of moisture in your nose. So I'll demonstrate. Pull down your mask, open the swab, five seconds in one there, one, two, three, four, five, only about a half inch in to the other nair, one, two, three, four, five. Take the swab, insert into the bottom hole until it goes all the way to the top. Rotate it three times, one, two, three. Peel off the little sticky, stick it, and then set your timer for 15 minutes. Okay, it's been 15 minutes, and this is my test here. As you can see, it is negative. So the top line is pink. It turned from blue to pink. The bottom line is not present, so that means that's a negative test. This is a control, the positive control, and you can see what a positive test would look like. The top line is pink, the bottom line is also pink, so that's what a positive test would look like. When you're done with this test, throw this into a sharps container, and then you are done with the test. A couple of key things to go back over. One, we have to report all tests, negative, positive, and conclusive. Please make sure that you go online onto that form fill out all the questions, and then submit that form. Remember, this is a lateral flow test, so the test has to remain flat. You can't carry it around, hold it up, push it down. It needs to remain flat for those 15 minutes. Remember to check for the control. Check for the blue line before you start the test. If there's not a blue line, do not use that card. Also, the blue line must turn pink whenever you run the test. You need to wait 15 minutes whenever you run the test. Not before, you can go up to 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, you need to discard the test and use another one. So you can read the test between 15 and 30 minutes. 15 is the optimal time. Remember to put six drops of the reagent into that top well, only six drops. And then invalid test, when you look at the results, when you look at these two lines right here, if you don't see any lines, that's an invalid test. If only the sample line is seen and not the control line, that's an invalid test. If the blue control line stays blue, that's an invalid test. Okay, so you gotta look for those things. On the swab, only use the swabs that are provided. Put it into your nair about a half an inch, rotate it five seconds, pull it out, place it into the other nair, Rotate it five seconds. And then when you put it into the card, remember, rotate three times. Peel off the sticky and then let it sit for 15 minutes. That's all covered on that procedure card, just in case you forget. Um, if you have any questions about these tests, please let me know. Again, Dr. Jarvis is covering some of the science stuff. You got to stay safe. Howdy, y'all. So Mike just talked to you about why we're doing this testing, how we're doing it, what the process is. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the test itself. But 
I figured I would go ahead also and make sure that I don't have COVID cooties right now. Um, I certainly hope I don't because um, I am at least two weeks past my second dose of um, no COVID cooties. And uh, I'd like to believe this shot works. So let's see if I can do this with a one. So, Oh, I'm not feeling All right. This is my captain. Nice little blue line there. Fortunately, I'm the only one testing. All right. Hey, Siri, set a timer for 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes and counting. Why, thank you, ma'am. So let's talk about this test. What is it? So this is a lateral flow immunoassay test. So let's talk about the lateral flow and the immunoassay. So a lateral flow, uh, you can also hear about these things referred to as chromatography. Um, lateral flow just means that you're using capillary action to suck up the liquid nasties and it moves in capillary formation down to where the reagent is. All right, that's all lateral flow means. So what's the immunoassay? How does this work? Well, we are testing for COVID antigens. So the SARS-CoV-2 antigen. And remember that the antigen is the little thing on the virus. And specifically here, we're talking about the spike protein. That's the antigen. And that is what is identifying the virus as friend or foe. And in this case, very much foe. Our body makes antibodies to that antigen. So it's like a lock and key. What this test does is it uses that immunology and it takes antibodies to the antigen and it binds them to the test strip. So the test strip comes with antibodies in them. And the antibodies are linked to a, a little dye, a, a color reaction or reactant. And when you set up the reaction, so you put in the diluent and the reaction, um, this thing. You put that in, the juice comes in, the little lateral flow thing gets activated. And by that, I mean it mixes the sample with the antibody. And if you happen to have antigen in your nose, the antibody that's bound to the card and the color thingy binds to the antigen. And that binding enables the color change. So when we see a um, second red light, red light, red line on there, that's because the antibody built into the card has reacted with COVID antigen. All right, so that's what this is. Remember that we are testing antigen, not antibody. Antibody tests do exist, and they have some lateral flow ones that look a lot like this. If you test positive for the antibodies, that just means that you have been exposed at some point in time. Whether it's IgG or IgM, you have been exposed at some point in time, and you may have antibodies, or you may have some immunity to it. We're testing for the antigen, which means if it is present and it is detected, you have uh, COVID. You are positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That also means that you are capable of transmitting it. All right, we're testing for antigen. How well does this thing work? Let's go over some performance characteristics. And I created a two by two table um, and I populated it with data that came from the validation studies that the manufacturer Abbott used to calculate how well this works. And this is a two by two contingency table. This is the key to epidemiology. Almost all cool things in epidemiology can be calculated if you lay out your data in this way. And as a bonus nerd tip, if you wanna do a chi-square calculation, this type of test can, uh, is very, very useful for that. All right, so what did we find? So if you look at this table, what this is showing you is you have PCR testing across the top. That's the gold standard. 
That's what we're getting done at Scott & White where they take a core sample of your brain. Thank God this is just an anterior nasal swab. I'm so liking that. So across the top is PCR testing and you can see whether that is positive or negative. And then down the side is the Abbott Binox Now test. That's the rapid lateral flow test that we're using. And you can see whether it's positive or negative. And then if you can see the numbers out of the 460 total people who were tested, you can see the numbers both who were positive on the PCR, negative on PCR, positive for the Binox Now, and negative for Binox Now. And where those interact, gives you some ideas about the performance characteristics. So you see up here we have um, where both are positive. Those are our true positives. Then you can also see the uh, false positives, the false negatives, and the true negatives. So we want to know sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is calculated, as you can see here, the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false negatives. And that's basically the true positives plus all of the people who actually have the disease according to the gold standard. And then specificity is the true negatives divided by everybody who had a negative gold standard test. Well, why do we care about these things? Well, if you think about sensitivity, a highly sensitive test is used to rule out a disease. And what that means, a highly sensitive test will be positive if the disease is there. Now, it may be positive if the disease is not there, too. Like, for example, if you wanted to say an incredibly highly sensitive pregnancy test will be positive any time you use it. Now, if the woman who is, well, the person who is taking that test is pregnant, well, it's going to be right because it's going to be positive. The problem, though, is it's going to get a whole bunch of false positives because if I take it, it's going to say I'm pregnant. Pretty sure that's not the case. All right, so what's the value? The value then of a highly sensitive test is we use it to rule it out because if that says you don't have it, you really don't have it. Specificity, on the other hand, is the ability of a test to be negative when you really don't have it. What that means is that if it says you have the disease, then you really have it. So the way I remember this is that sensitivity used to rule things out. So snout, S-N for sensitivity, to rule things out. Spin, S-P for specificity, to rule things in. Well, how do the numbers for this test shape up? Well, so sensitivity is 99 over 117, and that comes out to be 84.6% sensitive. Specificity is 338 divided by 334, or 98.5% specific. So what we see about this test, very specific, meh, on the sensitivity. That's great, Jeff. What does that mean? It means if this test is positive, you have COVID. If it's negative, on the other hand, odds are likely you don't have COVID, but it may miss some. Let's just talk about why we are using a test that has low sensitivity. First off, all of the COVID testing out there is way more specific than sensitive, but we are willing to accept this test, which has lower sensitivity, because we're making up for it with volume. We're testing on a regular scheduled basis. So our goal here is to interrupt asymptomatic spread. And that is the real boogaboo with this disease is that it spreads when you're asymptomatic. And it's just not fair. This virus is not playing fair. So our goal to really keep us healthy and keep us in the game and in service is to identify rapidly the asymptomatic positives. If we can identify you, remove you from the herd, if it is, if you will, and isolate you, then, or me, or anyone, then we decrease the chances of spreading the infection. So that's the, the science behind the test. The one other thing I wanted to talk about, because this may pop up, is cross-reactivity. How well does this test tell the difference between SARS-CoV-2, which is the novel coronavirus, 
the, the one that causes COVID-19, and other things. Like, would it be positive if I just had a run-of-the-mill cold, which is coronavirus, just the regular coronavirus? No. It does not, and they specifically tested that, it does not cross-react with run-of-the-mill coronaviruses. Now, it does have cross-reactivity, though, with SARS-CoV-1, and that is the thing that actually caused the SARS outbreak back in whenever it was, early 2000s. Now, so that means that if I have SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2, this will be positive. Now, why am I okay with that? I'm okay with that because we haven't seen SARS-CoV-1 in years. It just isn't in circulation right now. So really the only thing we're worried about is SARS-CoV-2. It also does not interact with influenza or adenovirus or rhinovirus or any of those other viruses. Now, what about other stuff in your nose? The two most common things that are gonna be up there is blood and boogers. Blood and boogers does not interfere with it. Um, I like the, the test says endogenous substances. That's blood and boogers. It doesn't uh, cross-react with that. It also doesn't cross-react with the normal stuff that a lot of us shove up our noses in the middle of uh, cedar season. Uh, so nasal sprays and uh, like nasal saline and just over-the-counter uh, phenylephrine or any of those other uh, drugs that just over-the-counter nasal sprays, uh, fluticasone, none of those cross-react with it. Also doesn't cross-react with antivirals, so if for whatever reason you're taking Tamiflu, um, doesn't interact with that. Uh, antibiotics like nasal antibiotics, if you are carrying MRSA and you're putting uh, Mupercin up in your nose, it doesn't interact with that either. So overall, for what we're using it for, a daily or a weekly test um, where we're compensating for low sensitivity, I think this is a great way to keep our workforce safer. All right, guys, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope this has been helpful. And let's see where I am. Hey, timer's up. What's that, Siri? Oh. It's time to see if I have COVID. Why, thank you, Siri. How nice. Let's see. Let me put my glasses on here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Look at that. I am negative. The vaccine works. And, you know, masks work. And staying away from all other people work. So basically, I'm now getting the benefit of being an introvert. That works. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. Rolling, rolling, rolling.